Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Choices Finding Your Joy. I have another fantastic guest to share with you today. I have with us Christopher Kerr, MD, PhD, the author of Death is But a Dream. He is the CEO and Chief Medical Officer at Hospice Buffalo, born and raised in Toronto. Dr. Kerr earned his MD as well as a PhD in neuro neurobiology and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Rochester. His research has received international attention and has been featured in the New York Times, Atlantic Monthly, and the BBC. I am so honored to have you with us today, Chris. No, thank you very much for having me. Oh, just, you're amazing with the work you do. I, I have to say right off that I so enjoyed your book. It touched my heart. And you had some really powerful messages. Well, thank you. It's fantastic. I, I would love to have you share. Um, you know, you're a medical doctor who's now CEO and chief medical officer at Hospice Buffalo. Tell us about what brought you there, a bit of your career journey. Sure. Um, uh, coincidence, I guess, or unusual events. I was actually uh, very much interested in acute medicine. So I did ER medicine and I was actually a cardiology fellow and I needed to support my family and I was looking for weekend work. And coincidentally, I saw an ad in the paper for a hospice doctor on the weekends. Um, and so I really started this in 1999 just as a, as a, as a part-time job. And after about six or eight months, I realized I was probably doing the most meaningful work uh, I could imagine. And I left cardiology and have done this for 21 years and never looked back. That's fantastic. And, you know, you share so many amazing things. You share interviews with over 1,400 patients, and you did a decade-long study. Tell us about your study. Tell, tell everyone about that. Sure. So um, what actually happened was early on in my career here, uh, I, I quickly learned from my colleagues in nursing and social work and pastoral care that there was a non-physical aspect to dying. Um, there was actually the experience that the patient was having. And um, I, I was surprised to learn from a medical lens that we often view dying as organ failure. And what we see is physical suffering and the feeling of loss. And really what I saw was people were also having very life-affirming um, experiences. And so in an attempt to teach that to, to students, I was frustrated because their reply would often be, well, there's no evidence for this. So on that basis, we started doing a number of studies um, and asking people about these experiences. We used, you know, formalized questionnaires and, uh, and started to publish studies. The other thing we did that was really smart was we videotape patients and families because there's an assumption that these people are confused or feeble-minded and it was really important to capture them in their own words. Yes and you share so many stories about pre-death dreams and visions that your patients go through and these actually really humanize the dying process don't they? Yeah, I think that's where we kind of end up with this. If, if you look at it as um, we sort of dehumanize dying by medicalizing it. And if you think about it, the, the dying is, is really one of the most authentic human experiences there is. And, um, you know, from the patient's perspective, they're not seeing it through organ failure of dysfunctioning heart or kidney. They're actually in a very unique vantage point where they're actually reflective and looking back on their life and they're feeling what matters yes and you know something that just came over me with you know reading all these amazing sharings of your patients how they would have a dream or a vision of a past loved one or and I'm just going oh my gosh 
I'll see Annie and Uncle Ernie. I'll see my mom, my dog, Shotzi. I mean, it's you just then fantasize. What would it be like for me? Yeah. It's amazing to, to see this. You know, there you had patients that, you know, people that had passed that had been a big part of their life or their childhood, and they would kind of come back to that, wouldn't they? Yeah, so what we did is we um, would ask people daily up until death what they were seeing or experiencing. And uh, the, what happened was as they got closer to death, there was an increase in frequency in these very vivid, uh, almost virtual-like dreams. And predominantly, um, the themes were uh, seeing the deceased. And it was really interesting when we asked them to grade out the comfort of this, seeing the deceased more than anything else gave the highest comfort. So it's almost like there's this built-in mechanism that's self-soothing as people get closer to the end, um, the people who they loved and who nurtured them uh, return to them in some form. And the, the fear of death seems to lessen and their comfort and you know, on reflection, the meaning of having lived uh, increases. Yeah, so this really helps them be more comforted and relieves the fear of death. Yeah, very, very much. And it really, it doesn't deny death, um, but it validates having lived. And ultimately it reestablishes this kind of a connectivity um, to those people who matter to you most. And what's interesting is, is time seems to be irrelevant. So you could have a 95 year old gentleman who lost his mother when he was five and it's her voice that he hears and it's her perfume that he smells. Um, so people are flooded with, um, with feelings uh, of really overwhelming warmth and comfort. Very little is said usually between people, but they're, but they're given a, a, a sense. Yes, yes. And I can imagine what, what that's like seeing that experience and seeing, you know, how that helps those patients in their final days. Yeah, and, and, and it helps their family. Um, their loved ones. And we've done studies of hundreds of bereaved people and those who witness or experience this um, in their loved ones passing do better in their grief processing. Because how we see someone dying very much affects how we process loss and sadness. Um, so it recontextualizes or redefines the dying process of, of, of something more than just grief but there's something again, that's very positive and life affirming. Um, so it, you know, I really encourage people uh, to go to my website, um, as it says, drchristopherkerr.com. And one of the things that I'd encourage is, is look on that site because there's playlists and you can see patients and families in, in, in those uh, at that site. And it's really important to hear them in their words. Oh, it's, it's really, it's really beautiful for others to learn about this and know about this. It, it really gives a sense of comfort, I can imagine, to the family, seeing that with a person. Something you, you have in your book that you, you wrote, Chris, death becomes more enlightening than a simple pulling down of the shades. I thought that was... Amazing. What what message did you want to give with that? Well, I, you know, I think that again, we see death as a as a lessening, um, as we see physical decline in front of our eyes, um, and 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 what's happening is there's actually a paradox. They're they're dying, but spiritually or psychologically, they're very st much still alive. We actually did a study that looked at dying as post traumatic growth. And what we find is people who are having these experiences are actually still gaining insight, still adapting um, right up until their last days. So again, this idea that it, it, it's, it's more than diminishing, uh, it actually is enlightening for many, many people. Yeah. So really in those last days, they can become so enlightened and mm -hmm. still learning and yeah, and it's really important we're not talking about the last minutes of death, you know, where people are clearly oxygen deprived or medicated. We're often talking days, weeks, and even months before death. 
And you can tell in the videos that they sound like you and I. They're very cognitively intact and aware and uh, insightful. Yes, yes. Something else you've said, Chris, dying includes more than the physical suffering that we observe. There is a better, less fearful aspect to the end of life. One that validates the life lead, lessens the fear of death, and often returns us to those things that we have loved the most. So do you yeah. think our society uh, needs sort of a spiritual renewal in patient care? Yeah, well, I, I, yes, very much. I think, you know, we've kind of lost our way with dying as we've um, become ultra-medicalized and ultra-technical. You know, we actually uh, spend more money in the last few months of life than any other time, and yet it doesn't really change outcome. We still treat dying as something uh, to cure um, and without recognizing there's this non-physical piece to it. Um, there's inevitability and there's a spiritual aspect. It's more than a medical phenomena or a medical treaty. It's a, it's a human event. I love that, a human event. Yeah. So it's, it's this whole scenario of those final weeks and days. It's not just our body. We're, we're going through a real process with our mind and our emotions. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, I, the, the best way to look at it is, um, yeah, it's, it's more than failing parts. It's a uh, closing of a life. Yeah. And a, li a life isn't defined um, in, in, in a medical framework. Um, it, it's really defined more by relationships and events that really, really truly matter. And it turns out those are the things that come to surface at the end of the life that really define us, um, that give us true meaning. And uh, that's what it turns out seems to matter to people who are dying. Yeah, because, you know, I would... You know, I, I would really think that, that that totally makes sense because our life is experiences, our whole lifetime. So it makes sense that we're going to think about those experiences, the people we love, the people that were in our lives, a lot more than what car we drove. I mean... Yeah, we actually showed that, is that the content of these dreams changes from kind of daily concerns and stressors to actually the, the real stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you've been able to see people experience and go to that real stuff, haven't you? Yeah, very much. We see it every day. Yes. And I love, you know, in your book, you describe what made, you know, you making the decision to apply to work at hospice Buffalo and then really that kind of affected you a lot, didn't it? It it really, it seems like you loved what you were doing, Chris, and helping these patients. Yeah, you know, hospice gets a lot of care right. Um, they allow uh, the clinician to have enough protected time to get to know the patient as a person. Um, they know them in the context of their lives, their families. Uh, people die in totality, uh, and we get to have to at least honor that. It includes other disciplines because, again, dying is more than a, a medical equation. So there's spiritual counselors, there's nurses and social workers, and music therapists. So I think we, ta we take um, a perspective that allows for really true whole person care. Um, and that, in turn, humanizes medicine and as a doctor, it, it becomes a lot more rewarding um, to, to, to have that sort of uh, return. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deeper, more validating uh, process. Yes. What different, different uh, processes would you like to see with the end of life care? And have you kind of been able to work those, you know, it, practices in what you do at Hospice Buffalo? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, too few people access hospice too late. 
um, and, 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 and it, it should be further upstream in illness and it shouldn't be an issue of care or cure versus comfort. The two should be not mutually exclusive, but simultaneous. So this notion of palliative care, which is aimed at enhancing quality of life needs to occur upstream uh, in illness. You shouldn't have to be dying to get this good a care. I love that. And of course, the model of, of taking care of people actually where they live with their illness, which is in their home, um, becomes very, very important. Right now, we treat people episodically with hospitalizations, um, which with their care is the best in the world, but that's actually not where they struggle with their disease. There needs to be more concern for practical needs, how people cope and manage, that sort of thing. Yes, yes. Do you have any advice for loved ones that are dealing with helping a, a loved another loved one in their last days? Yeah, I mean, one is that um, that that that, that uh, they need help. Um, that it's difficult. It's the most difficult, most meaningful work you'll ever do as a caregiver. Um, but to, to to get help, particularly from your hospice. Um, that it's not, hospice isn't life denying or it doesn't hasten death. You actually live longer in hospice care uh, than if you don't. So get help and support. And uh, then there's all the reality that not everyone should die at home. Um, some people are difficult to manage or you're compromised or it's just too difficult. And that's okay too. Yes, yes. Yeah. With all the wonderful stories and examples you share in your book is there is there one that really really touched you and and really brought brought something to your mind of kind of a wow is there one you'd like to share with us yeah there's many but i i think the children in the book are remarkable um you know i uh, children don't have language for death or references for mortality um that sort of thing. And, and, and what was fascinating with the children is they end up having these kind of same self-informing experiences to let them know that they were um, at the end of their life, but that they were okay. So when two of the children discussed in the book, they hadn't known somebody who had passed, but they had known pets that they had loved and lost. And that's who returned to them in their dream. What was fascinating was that the message was the same, which was they weren't alone and they were loved. And the children in their own words say, I'm going to be okay. Um, so what we're struggling to, again, find language to um, reassure or comfort them, they basically found it in themselves. Yes, yes. And really, this is something really beautiful and exciting really to realize you know our life as we progress and we get down to those final days and weeks it it really is just a re, you know I guess it seemed to me like they reviewed their life so many of your patients still had their sense of humor they felt better with these dreams and these visions coming. And that's kind of exciting for, for everyone to realize that these, these things happen. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 there's a better story. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ah, yeah, oh, that's a perfect description. I love that. It is, it's a better story than what most of us assume. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, uh, Chris, also, can you take a moment, please, and share with us where people can get a copy of your fantastic book? Oh, sure. So it's available online in bookstores. Uh, it's called Death is But a Dream. And if you just want to know, I encourage you to go to my website, which is Dr. Christopher Kerr, K E R R, uh, dot com. And uh, there's some links, I think, to our studies that you could read. And again, there's, there's videotapes. Those videos are actually used. And now there's a full-length documentary coming and a Netflix show in the fall. So lots more to see. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. 
how can the the viewers today find the the Netflix and the documentary? The well, Netflix is isn't being going to be aired until the fall. Okay. Of 2020. And the uh, film is in the film festival circuit right now, but hopefully will be aired on another ma media platform. Oh, that's exciting because yeah. all of this is just inspiring and touching and, and really heartwarming. Oh, what, what prompted you to write this book, to put this out there for people? It was actually probably the last thing on my list to do. <laughs> um, what, I, what I originally tried to do was just publish the studies to prove evidence. So I was trying to um, inform my fellow doctors. And what happened was the information eventually seeped into the popular press and went around the world. Um, and what happened was I was just receiving enormous, overwhelming feedback from caregivers and people facing the end of life. And this was the first time their experiences were validated. And it seemed to mean so much. And that's, it was really the responses of people and bereaved particularly who kind of propelled the book forward. Wow. It wasn't intentional. It was based on people's responses uh, yeah. to the work, yeah. which again was interesting because I never meant it to go to that audience. It was meant to be in the medical journals. Uh -huh. And it's, it's now out there for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. But if, the other thing you can do is look at the Ted talk. If you just type my name, Chris Kerr and Ted talk, that'll appear. And that's a better description. But again, I think it's really important to see the videos of the patients because they, it's better to hear it in their own words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I would imagine that, that doing this work with all of these amazing patients, I bet it's really been a bit life-changing for you. Yeah, I, and people often assume it's depressing. It's actually in many ways uplifting. We, we, what we, we also get to see people at their very best. Uh, caregivers who are selfless, uh, who find courage, um, who unbelievable acts of kindness and love. Um, so we're just kind of privileged to be a part of, of all of that. Yes. Yes. And I can imagine the caregivers, what, what that's like for them and what they see and what they hear. Yeah. I mean, they're the real heroes here. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I would think that is one of the most valuable, important jobs out there. Yeah, well, it's life-changing. Yeah, absolutely. very life-changing. With just a few minutes left, Chris, what, what last words or thoughts do you want to leave with everyone today? Yeah, I, I think it's important. Um, when we think of dying, we, we really are discomforted because we imagine what it's like. And I think instead of imagining, it's actually very important to hear from people who are actually dying what the experience is, because there's, there's, there's more to it than what we assume. And that void of understanding is often filled with fear. And, and, and again, I think there's a, there's a kinder story within, within this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a great point, because with not knowing, we just kind of assume something. We assume the worst. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We yeah. we really don't have facts, and so we just and you're right. Assume the worst, which yeah. you know would be a lot of fear. And what you share in this book really is an eye opener and and a heart heartwarming, Chris. Well, thank you. I am really grateful, and it's it really is a touching book and a valuable book, I think, for anyone to read because of what we do learn and we can change those assumptions that we've made. Yeah, I think God. so. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I'm really happy to have you come on the show and share this with us today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you it's very a much. It's valuable message. Thank you. And, Everybody out there, love, hugs, and blessings. Chris, love, hugs, and blessings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It was so great. Oh, and meeting.